Crawford, go ahead and bump up another 7,500 foot. Copy. Described fire is a purposefully set fire under predetermined conditions in a specific place by highly trained and qualified personnel. Light your torch, walk back in just a little ways, and, uh, and, and just light coming back this way. The, the Albany Pine Bush Preserve is a uh, fire-adapted ecosystem, which means it needs fire in order to survive in a healthy state. The lack of fire in the pine bush creates situations where both plants and wildlife can live here, but their ability to live here is decreased. The main species here is the carnival blue butterfly, and the butterfly require the wild blue lupin flower for their coexistence. With the lack of burning, the pine bush becomes overgrown. The pines, the oaks, the scrub oak, they just overtake the area. So we burn the pine bush for that reason. We also burn it because with the lack of fire, all the fuels build up. The oaks, the, the oak leaves, the needles. We exist within what's called a wildland urban interface. The threat of wildfires is higher with the lack of burning. So by burning, we're actually reducing that, that hazard so that if there was a wildfire, it could be managed more effectively. Yes, please, thank you. The steps in planning a prescribed fire start initially with getting our permits from, from the state. We go through a process of evaluating the given area, developing appropriately sized and, and located and arranged management units. So each management unit tries to maximize the amount of the fuel as well as the prospective natural or artificial fire breaks that are out there. The prescription is then written using computer modeling to try and identify the, the best environmental conditions for, for, for implementing a prescribed fire so that it's neither too cold nor too hot. Once that prescription, as it's known, is approved, we then set about preparing the fire breaks, typically by hand with hand crews. On the day of the burn, we will then station our equipment, our fire engines, our, ex, our extra backup water supplies, hand tools, the day would begin with a briefing where we go over the prescription and all of the conditions that are appropriate and what's not, as well as contingencies for any potential negative actions over the course of the day. Once we've both gone through that briefing, which typically takes about an hour, we walk the burn crew around the unit, uh, orienting them to that particular management unit as well as the goals that we're trying to achieve. Stuff like this I want your crew to keep an eye on, just to be vigilant with. So. We then set about by lighting a test fire burning into the wind initially to evaluate smoke and fire behavior. Yeah, we just lit a test fire on antelope. If the smoke and fire behavior is within acceptable ranges, we would then initiate and carry out the, the actual burn. All uh, members who are on a burn crew wear what's called Nomex clothing. Nomex clothing is fire resistant clothing for the wildland firefighter and the prescribed burn crew members. We also wear hard hats and leather gloves, leather boots, and typically most crew members will also carry a radio. Head, try to move just a little bit faster if you could. We also use smaller firefighting engines, or brush trucks as they're commonly known as, and those will typically carry two to three hundred gallons of water. We also use several handheld tools. We use what's called a Pulaski. You know, Pulaski is a combination axe and uh, hoe for grubbing in the ground. Another tool is called a swatter. It's a tool that looks like a, a mud flap extended on a long handle. You basically just drag it across the fire, and what you're doing is you're smothering the fire. You're uh, reducing the oxygen. Our crew members will carry these, uh, these backpack pumps uh, and uh, use that to either cool a fire down or to actually put a fire out. This tool is called a drip torch. And the drip torch is, uh, uh, it holds about a gallon and a half of fuel, and uh, as you see, it has a, a pigtail on the spout and that pigtail just allows um, the fire to not go back into the tank. There is a fairly extensive training regimen that's required to even participate on a prescribed burn crew. And then if you want to move up within the chain of command from being a crew member to, say, a line boss, someone who supervises half of the burn, or all the way up to the fire leader, there's additional training that's required. Everything from first aid and CPR to a whole host of federal wildland firefighter courses from your most basic S-130, 190 basic wildland firefighter training up to other so-called S courses which are geared both at toward 
teaching you how to be a, a good prescribed fire person as well as a, a someone who can respond appropriately to suppress fire if need be. And as you move up the chain of command, there's also an incident command system that you need to learn, um, which basically teaches you the chain of command and the levels of responsibility for each position as you move up to eventually an RXB2 burn boss, which is the position that I hold. The positive results of a prescribed fire are, are no, there are several. One, again, it opens up the landscape so that grasses and, and uh, flowers and other uh, plant species can grow. It helps maintain the, the balance of exotic plants. Uh, for example, we have black locust and uh, quaking aspen, for example, moving into the preserve because of the lack of fire. The fires also allow us to maintain uh, the ability for the pitch pine and the lupin to reproduce. Both pitch pine and lupin need to deposit their seeds directly into the sand. With the lack of fire, there's more litter and more decaying plant material on top of that sand so that the seeds don't survive. The pine bush really is a unique ecology. There are fewer than 20 known examples of inland pitch pine scrub oak barrens anywhere in the world. Most of those are gone or so severely degraded that they can no longer be considered viable. And despite that, it's still the best worldwide example of this plant community and supports more than 40 species that New York State considers to be species of greatest conservation need. And to have that here in the heart of the Capital District uh, with, in such a populated area, it's such an amazing educational and recreational resource, the Pine Bush is truly something special.